Okay, this is going to be part two of our respiration notes. And let's look at some devices you can use to do lung volumes. Here are some things called spirometers. S-P-I-R-O-M-E-T-E-R. -E -E They're apparatuses used to determine lung volumes. And I have three here. Um, the one on the left is called a wet spirometer, and it's called a wet spirometer because that blue tub is full of water. And this little white tub on top is turned upside down. And in the middle, there's a tube coming up in the very middle that's going to touch the top of this uh, upside down white tub. And that's attached to this hose. And you see that this white tub is attached to a little metal chain it will go up and it, and it uh, has to do with pushing this little black, you can see a little black uh, uh, finger-like structure that's going to move across a scale here. So this is a blowing device. Uh, this scale is not set. That little black thing should be way over here to the right, up against that little, little the black rubber structure. When you exhale into this device, into this, this uh, rubber tube here, the air goes into the white tub and it floats. And as it floats, it pushes this little black uh, finger across the scale from right to left there and it tells you how much air you've exhaled. <clears throat> so you can do some of your lung volumes with the wet spirometer and again it's called wet because it has water in this tub. A dry spirometer is, doesn't have water that's why it's called dry and these are the little mouth pieces that go over this, this uh, mouth here. And you can turn this silver ring to where the zero comes where that uh, needle is and as you blow in here a little propeller turns in here and that needle spins around the scale and tells you approximately how much air you've exhaled. And you can do with either one of these, the wet and the dry, you can do your uh, oh, several of your lung volumes. Okay. The incentive spirometer, I haven't used that too much. This is another one that you can blow into and you see that the little ball in here is going to float and that will tell you uh, the condition of your lungs and it also helps you determine your lung volumes a little bit. These over here on the left and right, the wet and the dry, these record um, the amount of air that you've exhaled. I like the wet one because it traps everything in the in the tub. I think the dry one is good. It's kind of expensive but it also I think it leaks a little bit because the numbers are not always the same between the wet and the dry. Let's look at some of the lung volumes that you can do with spirometers or some of these that you have yeah, that you don't really realize you're using during the day. <clears throat> Let's look at the first one. The uh, first one here is called the tidal volume. It's the little orange one in the middle. Tidal volume is abbreviated TV for tidal volume. The volume of air breathed in and out during normal quiet breathing. So while you're sitting here listening to this or you're watching TV or something, you have a shallow breathing. You see it's this little uh, uh, up and down curve as you're just sitting there. So you have a small amount that you breathe in and out. It's around 500 mils. That's about how much is in a Coke can. A can of Coke is about 500 mils. It's somewhere close to that. Um, it's a half of a liter, like a, uh, a uh, water bottle that you get, like, you know, the small water bottles. Uh, that's about how much air you breathe in and out just sitting at rest. And it's called the tidal volume named after the tide, you know, in the ocean, the tide comes in and the tide goes out on a regular basis. That's why they call that the tidal volume. Well, you know that you can breathe air in above that. Like if someone said, could you blow this up? You go and you inhale more air. That's called inspiratory reserve volume. So you're not really using your total, your total lung capacity uh, as you're just sitting here breathing. You have parts that uh, you can inhale above and exhale below. So right now you're living in your title, but if you need to inhale more, that's called your inspiratory reserve volume, IRV. And the definition, the volume of air one can in inhale above tidal. And most books will put that at around 3,100 mils. That's 3.1 liters. That's a lot of air. Well, you know that you're sitting here. You can also exhale more air than normal. It's called the expiratory reserve volume. Expiratory, E-X-P-I-R-A-T-O-R-Y, reserve volume. The volume of air one can exhale after a normal exhalation. So even talking to you right now, I was using my external 
about expiratory reserve volume because I had to um, exhale more air to talk to you. It's around 1,200 mils. The residual volume at the bottom of this uh, table here, R-E-S-I-D-U-A-L volume, R-V, uh, the amount of air which remains in the lungs after a forced exhalation should be forced, not normal, should be forced exhalation. This is due to the surfactant not allowing the alveoli to collapse. Remember that surfactant? This, the septal cells produce uh, the surfactant. They're, like you could call them surfactant cells also, but that won't let the air sacs completely deflate. And so this is the amount you cannot blow out. So you can exhale all you want, but this is the residual volume is going to stay in there. And it's around 1,200 mils. Now, we have the vital capacity. Vital means life. This is what you use during the day, uh, you know, to keep you alive. And it's VC. So look at the definition. The sum of the inspiratory reserve volume the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. So those top three, inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume, make up what we call the vital capacity. Look to the right there. You see that little clear box. Vital capacity, about 4,800 mils. This is what you uh, live off of during the day. And there's your equation. VC, which stands for vital capacity, equals, I've got TV for tidal volume, plus inspiratory reserve volume, plus expiratory reserve volume. Now, total lung capacity, look at the far one on the, on the far right, TLC includes all of the lung volumes. So that also includes residual. So the total lung cap capacity equals the tidal volume, plus inspiratory reserve volume, plus expiratory reserve volume, plus the reserve, residual volume. So it's all of them. That's total. What you live on during the day and night is vital. Total lung capacity includes your residual. Now we have something else called minute volume. Minute, M-I-N-U-T-E, volume. It's your tidal volume, which you breathe in and out normally times your respiration rate. Now, usually uh, that has to be something that uh, someone's going to watch you, you know, perform so that you can, they can tell you how many times you breathe per minute. Otherwise, you're not going to get an accurate amount, uh, a number when you uh, try to monitor yourself breathing. This is the volume of air exchanged with the lungs per minute. It's called the minute volume. And here I have a uh, respiratory volumes and capacities. So here's your your measurements over here for the different ones and you know the, de the descriptions. So this is another, another chart besides your notes that you can reflect on to uh, see what these different volumes are and their, uh, their volumes and their uh, purposes. Now we have something called partial pressure. So we're talking about Dalton's law here and we're only dealing with it just a little bit here. So Dalton's law states that each gas in a mixture of gases exerts its own pressure as if all other gases were not present. Just like in a room, a room will only hold so many people because each person is occupying a given amount of space. Well, that 760 millimeters of mercury of, of air pressure is due to all the gases. It's a column of air from sea level to the top of our atmosphere. Well, this pressure is called partial pressure. What part of the pressure at that area is made up of that gas? It's called partial pressure, P-A-R-T-I-A-L pressure. The total pressure of the mixture of gases is calculated by adding up all the partial pressures. And there's your atmospheric pressure there. And that's not all the gases that make it up, but that's just the major ones. And it's around 700 millimeters of mercury. And it's composed of the partial pressure of oxygen, so it, it, it could, it's a particular number out of 760, and partial pressure of carbon dioxide, partial pressure of nitrogen, the partial pressure of water vapor, of methane, of helium, of argon, you know, all these other gases that are in the atmosphere. 
make up that 760 millimeters of mercury. Now let's look at something we talked about earlier. External respiration. The exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the alveoli of the lungs, that goes in your blank, alveoli of the lungs and the blood, okay, of the pulmonary capillaries. So look at the definition here, it says external respiration. Look at where the picture is. The uh, structure on the left is an alveolus, so that's your lungs. And the, the red blood cell here, that's in your blood and the capillary going by your alveoli. So it says the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the alveoli of the lungs on the left and the, and the blood of the pulmonary capillaries on the right. So look at oxygen, this big red arrow. You see oxygen is leaving the lungs and entering into the red blood cell to be bound to hemoglobin. At the same time, carbon dioxide is leaving the red blood cell, this big black arrow, and going into the lungs. So this is the gas exchange external between the alveoli and the blood. So the, the uh, blood is taken on oxygen and given off carbon dioxide to return back to the system. And that was shown up here on um, this picture right here. See alveoli, oxygen is taken on and the PO2 in the lungs, the alveoli, 100 millimeters of mercury. Well, the, the blood coming by, the PO2 is 40. When it leaves, it's been raised up to around 100. The PO2 is about 100 to go out to the tissues. You look at carbon dioxide in the lungs, it's pretty low, 40, 40 millimeters of mercury. And carbon dioxide coming around is around 46. So carbon dioxide is given off in the lungs and when it leaves, there's less carbon dioxide in the lungs. So that's, what, that's what's happening here at external respiration. Well, the blood gets down to the tissues and that's internal respiration. The exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the blood and the tissue cells. So you look at this picture and on the left, there's the tissues. And on the right, here's the capillaries coming by the tissues. And you can see two things are happening. The tissues are giving up carbon dioxide, the waste gas of cellular you know, metabolism, uh, cellular respiration, and it's being taken into the red blood cell. And you see that oxygen is leaving the red blood cell and going out to the tissues. That's your internal respiration. <clears throat> now, these uh, alveoli, let's talk about the alveolus again, just a second, these little air sacs. Um, while we're down here, millions of these air sacs comprise the lungs. So if we, you know, went back up a little higher in your notes uh, to the last time that we were, we were talking, these alveoli, let's look at this one, millions of these comprise the lungs. Simple squamous epithelium, and there it is, five thousandths of a millimeter thick. That's that distance across the alveolar capillary membrane and the, and the uh, simple squamous epithelium of the uh, capillary. So between there is five thousandths of a millimeter thick. The lungs have a surface area of around 760 uh, square feet surface area. And that's a ballpark, um, um, you know, it's a ballpark number. Um, so just kind of remember that. Now, Transport of these gases, the transport of gases across, you know, the, uh, you know, the membrane there, oxygen does not easily dissolve in water. Now, 100 mils of oxygen, oxygenated blood, contains 3% dissolved oxygen. So oxygen travels in the uh, blood, about 3% is dissolved in the plasma of the, of the blood. 97% is carried by hemoglobin. And you can see that oxygen there is being combined with hemoglobin. And there it is, oxyhemoglobin. 97% is uh, carried by hemoglobin. And so your blank there is oxyhemoglobin. O-X-Y-H-E-M-O-G-L-O-B-I-N. That's oxygenated hemoglobin. And there's your little equation there, hemoglobin plus oxygen, and there's your oxyhemoglobin there on the right. When it reaches the tissues and releases its oxygen, it becomes hemoglobin again. 
So um, when it reaches the tissues, let's see, let's get to the internal. Internal right here, reaches the tissues. There it is, oxyhemoglobin, releasing the oxygen to the cells. It becomes hemoglobin again, and there it is. You see this, the oxygen is left, and there is hemoglobin. So 97% of oxygen is carried as oxyhemoglobin, 3% dissolved in the plasma. At rest, 100 millimeters or milliliters of uh, blood contains 20 milliliters of oxygen. Now we have an, uh, an oxygen or a hemoglobin meter at, at school that we used to be able to determine this, and we could, we could get a pretty good number on that. The partial pressure of oxygen determines how much oxygen combines with hemoglobin. Now here's fully saturated, it's just HBO2. Now we're not, we're, we're not ever gonna be fully saturated, that's toxic. Oxygen is toxic in high levels. We live in a partially saturated state. It's a mixture of hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. The percent saturation, that's what goes in your blank, percent saturation is the percentage of oxyhemoglobin in the blood. Now, like I was saying before, oxygen is toxic in high levels. Well, sometimes you need to get a lot of oxygen in your tissues uh, to fight off an infection like gangrene, and they'll put you in an oxygen tent. So they have to make sure there are no sparks in the area, nothing that can generate a spark, because oxygen would burn the area up very quickly. So what they'll do is they'll put you in an oxygen tent for a given amount of time to raise the amount of oxygen in your blood so that when the blood reaches the extremities where the gangrene is, uh, it would tend to kill the gangrenous uh, bacteria. They are anaerobes and they die in the presence of oxygen. And so you're trying to oxygenate your, your tissues a whole lot to kill them as well as the antibiotics trying to kill them. But you can't stay in there forever. So they raise the oxygen levels and you're in that tent for a while. pH. An acid environment splits oxygen readily from hemoglobin. Okay, so an acid environment. Okay, it's called the Bohr effect. Hydrogen ions bind to hemoglobin and decrease its oxygen carrying capacity. More carbon dioxide in the liquid, the greater the acidity of the liquid. So let's look at something before we get to any more definitions. Let's look at this picture here on internal respiration. When the tissues are giving off carbon dioxide as a byproduct of cellular respiration, let's follow this big black arrow into the red blood cell. The carbon dioxide combines with water in the red blood cell and in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, that's an enzyme, it produces carbonic acid, which is not labeled there. H2CO3 is carbonic acid. Well, carbonic acid will dissociate. It comes apart. HCO3 is bicarbonate. It's a bicarbonate ion, and there's your hydrogen ion. Well, look what hydrogen does. When oxyhemoglobin gives off the oxygen, hemoglobin is free, and hemoglobin will bind to that that hydrogen ion. So hemoglobin can act as a buffer by tying up hydrogen ions. Remember, hydrogen ions contribute acidity to a solution. Well, hemoglobin is going to bind that to help act as a buffer. So let's look at a uh, term here, acidosis, A-C-I-D-O-S-I-S. -I -I hydrogen ions create an acid environment. Hemoglobin releases oxygen um, and carbon dioxide levels are too high. Okay, so, car so an acid pH causes hemoglobin to release oxygen and that's a result of carbon dioxide levels being too high. As, see, as more carbon dioxide is, is present, it makes more uh, uh, carbonic acid. and It'll cause uh, hemoglobin to release its oxygen. This is one reason you can go under water and hold your breath as you as your cells produce more carbon dioxide and it's picked up by your red blood cells it causes more oxyhemoglobin to respond by releasing more oxygen to your tissues up to a certain point and then you feel stressed out the pH is getting too adverse and you come up for more air now acidosis occurs in hypoventilation when you're not breathing or breathing too slow like holding your breath 
alkalosis, A-L-K-A-L-O-S-I-S. -S. Okay, that's already written in. The blood has lost too much carbon dioxide and it occurs in hyperventilation. So you've lost too much carbon dioxide, like um, an external here. You've lost too much. That's when you're breathing fast, like, like if you're at a party or something and you're trying to blow up a lot of balloons real quickly, you can hyperventilate and you get a little lightheaded. Temperature, an increase in temperature causes oxygen to be released by the hemoglobin. All right, so temperature being hot can cause hemoglobin to release oxygen to your tissues. Metabolic reactions give off heat. Active cells require more oxygen. Therefore, the heat from metabolism causes oxygen to be released from the hemoglobin. So temperature also has an effect on uh, hemoglobin releasing oxygen. Something called DPG, it's that 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. Uh, it's found inside of red blood cells. Yeah, it, it's inside of all your cells. Helps to release oxygen from hemoglobin in low oxygen conditions. Now let's look at carbon dioxide. Four mils of carbon dioxide per 100 mils of deoxygenated blood. Now let's see how carbon dioxide travels. 7% is dissolved in the plasma. All right, so carbon dioxide can, 7% uh, can be dissolved in the plasma, whereas oxygen only 3%. 23% combines with the globin of hemoglobin. Okay, combines with the globin of hemoglobin, like on this picture here, there's the cells giving off carbon dioxide. Um, and here is uh, carbon dioxide combining Let's see, where'd it go? With the globin. No, we'll come back to that. To form carbon amino hemoglobin. Now when the partial pressure is high, carb amino, carb amino hemoglobin is readily formed. This is where carbon dioxide will combine with, here it is right here. I was looking for it, it needs to be somewhere. There it is right there. Carbon dioxide combining with hemoglobin, your carb amino hemoglobin. Um, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in pulmonary capillaries is low, and carbon dioxide splits off the carb amino hemoglobin readily. So when it gets back um, up to the top to your uh, to your lungs, this you see it's being broken down. There's your carb amino hemoglobin splitting off the hemoglobin and being released. But look how much carbon dioxide is transported in the plasma. 70% is transported in the plasma as bicarbonate ion. So on this internal um, transport again, there's your bicarbonate ion right there. And it's, it goes out into the plasma as bicarbonate ion. So we'll talk about that on this next uh, topic called the chloride shift. Now, as car, let's look at it again. Tissues are given off carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is combining with the water in your red blood cells to produce carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are bound to hemoglobin. Well, the bicarbonate ions are going to build up. So let's look at your reading here. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the tissue capillaries and enters the red blood cells and reacts with water. Here it is there, in the presence of carbonic anhydrase mm -hmm, to produce carbonic acid. The carbonic acid dissociates, and I showed you that, to bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin, and there's the combination there. As the bicarbonate ion amounts or ions increases, some of the bicarbonate begins to diffuse out of the red blood cell and into the plasma, and there it goes out. That's a negative ion out. In exchange for that negative ion out, the chloride ions diffuse from the plasma into the red blood cell. So it's keeping track of ions on both sides. As a as the bicarbonate leaves, a chloride ion enters. This exchange of a chloride ion from the plasma for a bicarbonate ion from the cytoplasm of the red blood cell is called the chloride shift. And there it is, the chloride shift. Now let's look at what happens when you get back uh, to the lungs. It's called the reverse chloride ion shift. 
the bicarbonate enters from the plasma back into the red blood cell, and the chloride ion goes back out into the plasma. So it reverses itself, and then that bicarbonate ion binds with the hydrogen that the hemoglobin releases as it's picking up oxygen. Hemoglobin releases the hydrogens, makes carbonic acid, which dissociates back into carbon dioxide and water, and the carbon dioxide is what is exhaled back or given off back into the alveoli and exhaled by the lungs. Now you have some respiratory centers here located in the uh, medulla and the pons. And we have the medullary, medullary rhythmicity center here. located in the medulla, is under autonomic control and functions to maintain a normal rate of respiration. Okay, we'll be reading some stuff for a while. Impulses from the inspiratory neurons stimulate the diaphragm, and there's a diaphragm uh, on this picture on the right, um, and external, inter external intercostal muscles to contract. Remember I told you that would make the thoracic cavity enlarge to increase the volume to decrease the pressure. As they contract, the thoracic cavity increases in volume and inspiration begins. After two to three seconds, the impulses stop and passive expiration occurs due to the muscles relaxing and the elastic recoil of the thoracic cavity. Impulses from the expiratory neurons result in contraction of the internal intercostal muscles that decrease the size of the thoracic cavity due to forced expiration, remember? Uh, inhalation by the uh, diaphragm contracting and the external intercostal muscles contracting, that's an active process because they're actively contracting. Exhalation is passive, but if you're going to force air out, that's going to involve your internal intercostals for forced ex expiration. Now the pneumotaxic area, P-N-E-U-M-O-T-A, XIC area or center is located in the pons. Now look on this picture and on the right hand side it says pontine respiratory group. Well there's the pneumotaxic area or center right there. Continuously transmits inhibitory impulses to the inspiratory area. This effect is to stop inspiration before the lungs become too full. Now the apneustic APNEU STIC area sends stimulatory impulses to the inspiratory area that activated and prolong inspiration and inhibit expiration. Okay, so this is going to be the center for respiration, controlling these muscle contractions. Now, chemical regulations. This is going to be just in your notes. <clears throat> Certain chemicals regulate respiration. All right. The chemoreceptive area located in the medulla is highly sensitive to blood carbon dioxide concentrations. CO2 is the main gas that's, that's measured by these chemoreceptors. Now, they're measuring oxygen also, but carbon dioxide is, a, is the main gas that's being monitored. One reason mainly is because that's also going to affect the pH of your body. Uh, your pH has to be maintained between 7.35 and 7.45, and respiratory movements are going to control the amount of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen in, your, in your, uh, your blood, and carbon dioxide is going to have an effect on the pH. Chemoreceptors located in the carotid and aortic sinuses are highly sensitive to oxygen and carbon dioxide blood concentrations. The receptors, these chemoreceptors, tell the respiratory center to increase or decrease the expiration rate according to the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressures of carbon dioxide. So they're always monitoring those. The carotid is going up to your brain and the aortic is the, uh, the aorta sending the blood out to your body. So those are two main areas. The brain gets the first blood and it's going to be real important that those chemoreceptors are working. There's a blank, hypercapnia. H-Y-P-E-R-C-A-P-N-E-A, hypercapnia. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, is too low, I mean, it's just too high, hyper. 
above 40 millimeters of mercury. Chemoreceptors will increase respiration until the carbon dioxide level is at or below 40 millimeters of mercury. If it's too high, you're going to become acidotic. Hyperventilation. H-Y-P-E-R V-E-N T-I-L L-A-T-I-O-N That's breathing too fast. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is too low. You've been venting off too much carbon dioxide. You're breathing real fast and the gas exchange is occurring faster than it's supposed to and so you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. Uh, so the PCO2 is below 40, 40 millimeters of mercury. Chemoreceptors are not stimulated and don't send any impulses to the inspiratory area and respiration slows until the PCO2 reaches 40 millimeters of mercury. Hypoventilation, H-Y-P-O-V-E-N-T-I-L-L-A-T-I-O-N, a slow rate of respiration. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide builds up in the blood, so hyp hypoventilation is going to cause uh, the blood to become too acidic. That causes hypercapnia. Oxygen receptors are sensitive to low levels of oxygen. Now the arterial PO2 is supposed to be around 100 to 105 millimeters of mercury. If the partial pressure falls to 50 millimeters, that's, that's pretty low, of hemoglobin, uh, then impulses are sent to the inspiratory areas and respiration increases. Okay, so 50 millimeters of mercury, I'm sorry, uh, falls uh, to 50 millimeters, your respiration is going to increase. If the partial pressure falls below 50 millimeters of mercury, inspiration area sends less impulses and eventually breathing stops. That's why when you walk up on somebody and they're passed out and they're not breathing, that's why one of the things in CPR is to check for a pulse. It doesn't mean your heart stopped. That means that your oxygen levels are so low that you stop breathing. That's why they try to get you to start breathing again. Other influences, um, things that can increase respiration. Uh, the first one is increased temperature. If you're hot, that makes your respiration uh, rate pick up. Prolonged pain, that'll do it. And then something that'll make you breathe, stimulate the anal sphincter. Things that will decrease respiration. Low temperatures, you tend to breathe you know, at a slower rate. Your heart rate's also slower also. Apnea, that's where you stop breathing. Irritation of the throat by chemicals or touch. That's like if you've uh, eaten something like hot sauce, sometimes it'll get to the back of your throat and you can't uh, breathe for a while. You can't swallow, can't breathe. <clears throat> have to kind of try to, try to drink something to, to wash that away from the back of your throat. And that ends this set of notes.